up in my mind, what would the first commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength look like in a very practical and real way? What would it look like? We talk about loving God and yet we can get pretty nebulous about that. We talk about loving our wives or loving our kids or loving the lost. And what does that look like in a person's life? And I think if we were to summarize the teaching of Matthew chapter 10, this is what we would walk away with, that a true disciple and a true follower of Christ loves God and loves Christ with every fiber of their being and every facet of their lives. It's all-inclusive. You love Him with everything. You don't keep something for yourself over here and something over here for yourself and then, oh, there's love for God, and oh, there's Sunday morning church. But it's everything. It's a comprehensive, inclusive love. and Nothing is left untouched by the hand of God in the disciple's life. And nothing is left untouched by the Word of God. Jesus so aptly said this in an economy of words in John 14, 15. He simply said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And the first commandment is what? To love him with everything. You are everything you have. And the essence of true discipleship is a God-centered, Word-centered life. Loving God, therefore living His Word. You can coin that phrase. To love God is to live out His Word, His command. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And that's what we've been seeing. We began to see last week and the weeks prior to that, that one of the disciples' greatest passions is to be like his teacher. We saw that in verses 24 and 25. As you're taught by Christ, you want to be like Christ. You want to be like your teacher. I, I don't know if any of you had great teachers in, in school. I had a couple great ones, and those are the guys I wanted to be like. Mr. Koenig, Mr. Cotts. They're great guys. I wanted to emulate them uh, even as a non-Christian. But now Christ is my teacher, and I want to be like Him. I want to put into practice what He teaches me. We also saw that the slave's greatest desire, since we are slaves of Christ, that was one of the great apostolic designations of themselves. You know, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus. Peter, a bondservant. John, a bonds, you know, a a servant in chains. Christ, that was one of their great... But the great passion of a slave, his greatest desire is to be pleasing and obedient to his master. Then we saw verse 25, which says that is enough. It's enough that the student, that the, te- the slave be like the teacher and the master. It's enough. Is that really enough for our lives though? Is our greatest desire to know and follow and please the one we proclaim as Lord and Savior? If that is enough, then we saw that it is the very essence of life. You know, Philippians 1.21, Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Why? Because I go into the presence of Christ. After 35 years of knowing Christ, he says in Philippians 3.10, that I might know Him and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings, be conformed to His death. That was the passion to the very end of His life. You know, I fought the good fight, I finished the course, I've kept the faith. In the future there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. He says to the Colossians, he says, then when Christ who is your life is revealed, you'll be revealed with Him in glory. So Christ becomes our life. Christ is our all. He is enough. And then we saw in that regard the disciple is to fear no man. And as he or she fearlessly proclaims and lives out the Word of God, We're not to fear the world's response or reaction. He warned us it might not be good. They may not like you. In fact, in some countries, they may kill you because you proclaim Christ, you proclaim the gospel. Jesus told us ahead of time they'll either love you or hate you in John chapter 15, so expect it. John 16.33, he summarizes that section And he says, in the world you will have tribulation. 
It says, but take courage, I've overcome the world. We serve a conquering, risen Savior who conquered sin and death and ultimately will conquer this world totally, completely, unequivocally, and He'll reign for a thousand years. You know, our only fear should be is that we should live lives of unbelief and hostile disobedience to God and His Word and incur the wrath and eternal damnation of rejection of God and, and His Word. Therefore, Paul or uh, Jesus said this in verse 28. He says, Do not fear those who kill the body. It's just the flesh, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear Him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We're commanded, don't fear man, but fear God. But for those of us who are in Christ, we saw that what I like to call a most gracious disclaimer in verse 31 we saw last week. and We ended with that. It says, do not fear. He just told us to fear, but now he says, don't fear because you are worth more valuable than many sparrows. <laughs> I love that. You know, it's like the intensity is way up here by the time you get to verse 31 and all of a sudden it goes <clears throat> right down here and it's like oh whew, man you know i don't know if i can live the life that he's talking about there but i can accept the love of god and i can operate out of the love of god because i'm more valuable than a than a sparrow and you know that that's an obvious understatement Because in Christ, you and I are infinitely valuable to the Father, no longer objects of His infinite wrath, but now objects of His infinite love. I love 1 John 4.18 where it says, perfect love, Christ's perfect love of us, casts out our fear of Him. So we operate out of a love relationship, not a fear relationship. Although we do fear, does it dishonor Him? By the way we choose to live and the things we choose to say. And we should. But ultimately, His love casts out our fear. Which brings up our next point. A true disciple, a confessor of Christ, is confessed by Christ before our Father who is in heaven. Look at verses 32 and 33. He says, Therefore, because everything I've said up to this point is true, therefore everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Now, beloved, those words demand careful self-examination. We really need to look at our lives in light of what he just said there because they tell us that a person's willingness to confess Christ before men determines Christ's willingness to confess that person before the Father and claim them as one of His own. Because if we deny Him before men and we won't mention Him before men, then why should Christ mention us before the Father? You know, if I don't love Him and He's not... You know, it'd be like having your wife with you. And you're in a crowd and you're you're with your wife and... You're talking it up with people and there's all kinds of people she doesn't know and you're just totally unwilling to introduce her as your wife. Right? Maybe you're at a party and you're all enamored with all the other women there or something. Enamored with the world. Maybe the truth of the matter is you don't love your wife. Maybe the truth of the matter is we don't love Christ. That's why we talk it up about the world and everything going on in the world and We don't talk up Christ. Maybe we don't confess Him for that very reason. You know, Romans 10, 9 and 10 defines true salvation for us when it says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And what he's telling us is that the reality of what you confess and what you talk up in this world is the reality of what's really going on in your heart. Makes sense. You know, think of that, think of that first time you met this marvelous woman that you married. You couldn't stop talking about her. Man, it, it just consumed your brain. And that's the way it should be with Christ. He should consume our mind and our heart. 
So much so that we're willing to confess Him before men. I was intrigued to read a a review of Greg Laurie's new book. I haven't read it, but the title says a lot. It says, the title of it is, Tell Someone. I was intrigued when it said, can you picture a turning on a TV news show and seeing a well-dressed news anchor sitting there and saying nothing for 60 minutes. <laughs> and according to... Th- Thanks, Milo. And according to Laura, Lori, that makes about as much sense as a Christian who says nothing about the good news of the Gospel to a desperate and sinful and dying world. We should talk it up. There's a great need. People need to know the news, Right? And people in our world need to know the good news about Jesus Christ. That's the only good news there is, actually. If you end up watching the news. (laughs) Then he asks the question, he says, if I don't want to tell friends and family and neighbors, why do we hate them so much? (laughs) You know, it would be like if I discovered the cure for cancer in this world and I just kept it to myself. Why would I do that? That would be the most ugly form of hate there is. If I've got the cure for the world's cancer, sin, why do I keep it to myself? I should tell everybody. You know, not everybody will believe it. Ah, those doctors. All they want to do is prescribe a pill. Well, if you've got a pill that works, you know, it's not a bad thing, right? We've got the ultimate pill, the pill for eternal life, the Lord Jesus Christ. I hate to compare him to a pill, but... We have the cure for the problem of man, death, and sin. Why wouldn't we tell anybody? A true disciple is a confessor, it says. That that means he affirms and agrees with God and the Word of God and fearlessly confesses it before men. In spite of their possible rejection and hatred, and they will hate you for it because... He knows full well that only Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but through Him. He knows it's an exclusive message. It's an exclusive cure. All other pathways lead to death and hell. I hope we realize that. And the eternal destiny of others depends on our willingness to confess our Lord before men. Yeah, is God sovereign over the salvation of men? Yeah, God saves them, but how does He do it? He uses it through our testimony doesn't he and you shall be my witnesses under jerusalem judea samaria uttermost parts of the earth and go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the father son and holy spirit teaching them to observe all that i have commanded you he uses us to get the word out he'll save them all we got to do is open our mouth all we got to do is confess him before men he will save them himself we don't save people i've never saved somebody in my entire life Although I've been in on a lot of it. But I've never saved anybody. I've been a mouthpiece. I've confessed. I've opened my mouth and blurted it out. And people have responded. But I've never saved anybody. God does that. That's His problem. My problem is to confess Him before men. That's where my problem ends. (laughs) All I've got to do is be a confessor, not just a professor. And the point is, a true disciple not only professes to believe in Jesus, but he confesses his faith in Jesus and the Word of God to a sinful, needy, lost humanity. And that person, it says, our Lord confesses before the Father and claims Him as His own. And I wrote down here, marvelously intimidating words. (laughs) You know, I don't know about you, but these words send shivers up and down my spine because they're scary. They're like the intensity is, if this were a chart, top of the chart, the intensity would be up here. I think of all those times I've kept quiet. I think of all the times I should have said something and said nothing. I sat there like the news anchor, begging, people are begging for news and I'm saying nothing. That shouldn't be. Then there's those times where I have said something and it takes away a little bit of the intimidation. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, man, if I do that, what you're saying, Bob, Pastor Bob, 
I'm really going to be causing some waves, especially in my own family. And if you're thinking that, you're exactly right. Okay, look at verses 34 through 39. He says, do not think I came to bring peace on the earth. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. This is the Prince of Peace. What's the problem here? What, you know, what's going on? This is the Prince of Peace, and he didn't come to bring peace but a sword? Well, yeah, he came to bring peace with God, not necessarily peace with everybody else. He says, for I came to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Why? Because you're confessing Christ before them. You're being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anybody have that experience? Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about, and we'll talk about that a little later. He says, he who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake, underline that in your Bible, for my sake, will find it. Now, there is so much here, but let's see if we can unpack some of it and Come to terms with it, but I would encourage you to just read it over and meditate on it and see how it applies to your life personally. Now notice, first of all, these verses are a restatement of the first commandment. That's the first thing you need to notice. That your love for God and your love for Christ is to take precedence over everything else in life. It's more important than family, relatives, other relatives, other relationships. In fact, it is more important than your own life itself. And what we're talking about, folks, is total, total commitment. And the fact is, there is nothing more important in this world than my love relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing. Nada. Niet. Nunca. <laughs> Any other language you want to put it in. There's nothing more important than my relationship, my love relationship with Jesus Christ. And that may bring a proverbial sword and divisiveness into many relationships in our lives. Fathers and sons, it says, mothers and daughters, daughter-in-laws and mother-in-laws. Your love for Christ and the Word of God may bankrupt their facade of tolerance. You notice in our world today, everybody's tolerant of everything but truth. (laughs) You know, those conservatives don't deserve to be heard. I mean, you've even heard that on the news now. Those Christians, they don't need to be heard. There's a great deal of tolerance for everything but truth in our lives because truth confronts the condition of man. Truth confronts what man is really like, and nobody likes to see themselves for what they really are. We love to lie. We love to, you know, put on a facade, put on the dog, put on whatever... You want to put on and try to, you know, it's like the fashion industry. It's all about inner beauty, right? Think about that for a minute, okay? (laughs) You know, it's all about putting on some kind of show for somebody who you really don't care about, and they really don't care about you. You know, when we're lifting weights, Steve and I, you know, for a while before I got old and weak, we had a competition, and... It was like, by the time we got done, it was like, you know, there's not anybody in the world that cares about this but you and me. <laughs> Who cares? I mean, what, what's the deal? So we try to please something that can't be pleased, and we try to live for something that can't be lived for, and we forget what the whole point is. Christ is eternal. You know, He came to bring a sword. But then we get back to verse 25, you know, is Christ enough? Is it enough that I love Christ and I love His Word and that my life is now in Him? Will that stand up even to, under the, the pressure and scorn of those we love the most? You know, sometimes that's the severest form of persecution. Being rejected and ostracized by those we love 
because of our love for Jesus. Sometimes that's the toughest thing there is. When family and friends kind of reject you because now you're different. You're, you're changed. You've got new priorities. You've got a new master. You've got a new teacher. You've got, you got new things in your life, new principles to live by, the Word of God. And they don't appreciate it. What are you going to do? Are you going to cave in and keep living like the world or keep living like whatever your family is into? You know, drugs, booze, sex, rock and roll, whatever. You know, are you going to keep living that way or are you going to live your life for Christ and be a testimony in that situation? You know, I, I was reading about a, a Chinese doctor just recently in, in World Magazine who his father and mother both punched him in the face when he professed faith in Christ. But before they died, they both became Christians. Because they saw a quality, they saw something in his life that was just otherworldly. Are you going to stand your ground? Are you going to stand on the Word of God? Are you going to stand on the rock who is Christ? Who is the Word of God? You know, sometimes the severest form of persecution is being rejected and ostracized by those we love because of our love for Jesus. And, you know, as I said, I could give a multitude of examples that I have dealt with over the years. Some were good, some were bad, but they illustrate this. But but I think I'll just let each of you leave you with your own thoughts because I know every disciple here knows and has experienced exactly what this passage says. But continue to keep in mind it's a matter of love, isn't it? And it's not that we love others any less. It's not that we love our family any less. It's just that we love Jesus more. And we're not willing to compromise to go down to whatever level people are choosing to live at. It's just we don't love them less. In fact, we probably love them more as, as we understand what the love of God is all about. But it's just that we, by comparison, we love Jesus more. And we're not willing to compromise our life to please them. We want to commit our life to pleasing Christ. Simple as that. And if we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, what's left over? That means that the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, Romans 5, 5, has to love these people through us, which is a much more powerful love. Think about it. That's why I can love my enemies, Matthew 5, tells me. Why? Not with my love. <laughs> my, my love wants to take my enemies and, aha, you know? I mean, let's face it, that's the way we are, right? But with the love of God, I can love even my enemies even those in my own household. It doesn't have to create strife and division, but I can love them and share with them and be there. That's why I can pray for governors, even liberals. And I can bless those who persecute me, Matthew 5, 10 through 12 tells me. Because we are not talking about a natural, limited, earthbound love here. We're talking about the love of Christ that He showed towards us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. A self-sacrificial love that values even its enemies. And that while we were enemies, Romans 5, 8, Christ died for us. We talk about the love of Christ, but how real is it? Do we really love other people the way they are? Or... Are we okay? Okay. Well, let's pray for her. Father, we lift Sandy up to You. And Lord, I just pray that, that You would put Your hand of healing on her, whatever it is. You've seen this before, but God, I, I just pray that, that You will intercede, that You will give strength, Lord, that You will uh, do Your perfect work in and through her. And God, we just lift her up to You and set her before Your throne. We pray in Jesus' name. She appears to be okay. Let's finish this up. All right? She's in good hands. Where were we? 
That's why we can love our enemies. <laughs> because of the love of God. Then we read this in verses 38 and 39. Go back to this, that passage. He says, or 37 through 39, he says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Now the cross at this time is an instrument of death. They're not understanding that the cross will one day be an instrument of life. So at this point when Jesus is talking about it, it's just an instrument of death. And he's telling us that a true disciple is willing to give up everything in this world, all that is dear to him, even his life, if it hinders him from being a true disciple of Christ. Because if he thinks he's found true meaning and ultimate purpose in life in anything or anyone other than Christ, he's eternally deceived and damned. That's what it's telling us. Because father and mother cannot be a deterrent, Even his own offspring, it says, cannot be a deterrent. And even his own life and dreams cannot be a deterrent. He must be willing to die to all these things in his pursuit to follow Christ. Because to find your life in any other person, pursuit, possession, will be to lose it eternally. As Luke 9.25 tells us, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What does it profit him? Better to lose this world in your pursuit of and love for Christ than to hang on to what is only temporary. As Jim Elliott so famously said, he said, He is no fool who gives up what he can never keep to gain that which he can never lose. You know, it was very insightful. The Alka Indians, they saw this little plane on the beach and these men as hostile. They ended up killing them the Indians killing Jim Elliott and his crew, uh, Nate Saint, and so on and so forth. Those men had guns with them. They could have blew up the whole Alka tribe if they wanted. But their attitude was, these men don't know Christ. If we kill them, they're going to an eternity of hell. If they kill us, we're simply going to heaven. I don't know if you can grasp the, the profoundness of that statement, but that's what he's saying here. We see a true disciple fearlessly confesses his Lord and the Word of God before men. He, he's counted the cost and is willing to pay the price, and consequently he's, effa- he's confessed by Christ before the Father in heaven and finds true life and purpose and meaning in Christ in this world. Now at this point, you may be asking, just how gracious is our Father? If I follow His Son like we've just talked about, what's in it for me? What's my reward? Well, look at verses 40 through 42. I'm sure Sandy will perk up. We're going over to Cambria by Wednesday to celebrate our 44th anniversary. Anyway, 40 through 42. We're at 44. He receives you, receives me, and he who receives me, receives him who sent me. He receives a prophet, and the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man, and the name of a righteous man, shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever, in the name of a disciple, gives to one of these little or humble ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward." Now, in each of these four statements, simply put, is the reward of eternal life. Those who receive you and your confession and testimony of Christ receive Christ, and to receive Christ is to receive the Father, and to receive the Father and the Son is to receive eternal life in the kingdom of God. I mean, that's just the the logical progression. Eternal, everlasting reward. John 1.12 tells us, As many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in His name. And notice how gracious our God is. To receive a prophet of God, to believe His message and show hospitality and love to Him, 
is to receive a prophet's reward. What's a prophet's reward? Eternal life. Ultimately, right? You know, in the future there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. You know, of eternal life. You may not have his boldness or his audience, but to receive him and listen to him and minister to him is to receive his reward, which is eternal life. All of a sudden, you know, the intensity is starting to scale down a little, isn't it? Just like the intensity before, you know, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell, but you're worth more than a sparrow. Keep this in mind. God is very specific, often severe in what He says and how we're to live. And yet at the same time, He is ultimately gracious. Keep that in mind too. This is also true of those who receive a righteous man. will receive a righteous man's reward. And what's that? Well, eternal life again. Genesis. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. We as believers receive those who believe and righteousness is accounted to us. God showers His blessing on those Christians who make love of the brethren a priority. You know, I think of the 11th commandment, John 13, 34 and 35. He says, A new commandment give I unto you that you Love one another, even as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this all men will know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That brings the intensity down even a little farther, right? Maybe I'm not the greatest witness in the world. Maybe I'm not the, you know, the boldest person in the world. But I can love the brother and I can love those who love me. But the big question is, are you? How are you involved in loving the brethren? How are you involved? It says, by this, all men. You know, that includes all men. will know that we're His disciple. They will see the testimony of our love for one another and they will be compelled to wonder where it's coming from. They will ask you rather than you asking them. You know, be ready to give a defense of the hope that's within you. And uh, Literally, Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, you know, be able to give a defense of the hope. It's in you. Why? Because people will literally ask you when they see you loving the brethren and and ministering to one another and being part of the body of Christ, the church, and so on and so forth. Very powerful thing. Very powerful thing he's saying here. When those who have been declared righteous by Christ love others who have been declared righteous by Christ, there is great reward both in heaven and on earth. But instead, today, we've kind of individualized Christianity. You know, I've often said that if you could gather all the Christians who claim to be Christians who don't go to church up here, we couldn't, we'd have to have a service every day, every hour of the week. Then he adds this in verse 42, and I love this. He says, Whoever in the name of a disciple, a disciple of Christ, gives to one of these little or the word is humble ones, even a cup of cold water to drink, I tru- truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. How gracious is our Lord? Well, any love or hospitality shown, even a cup of cold water given in Jesus' name will not be unrewarded. The little ones refers to those Christians who are seemingly insignificant and unimportant. Humble. Matthew 25.40 tells us that what we have done for the brethren, even the least of them, we have done for Christ Himself. Isn't that amazing? In all this, I see one thing. I see somebody who's focused on other people besides themselves. You know, I run across so many people who come to church with the idea, well, what's in it for me? And is the music good enough for me? Is the preaching good enough for me? Are they friendly to me? Are they, you know, me, 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 me. Well, what about others, others, others? Where does that come in? Where do you get your mind off yourself and on to others, serving others and ministering to others and loving others? You know, that's a tough thing, isn't it? 
particularly in our me-absorbed culture. So again, we see God's graciousness. And, and just as we are worth more than many sparrows, no good deed goes unnoticed. Even that which is done for the least of these, it's as if we're doing it for Christ Himself. But it's that mentality of thinking about others rather than myself. It's reaching out to others, even with a cup of cold water. Anything that gets you motivated to serve others in the body of Christ or, or minister those out in the world who need to know Christ and whatever shape that may take. So let's recap this real quick. What's a true disciple look like? Well, a true disciple's passion is to be like his teacher, his master, and that is enough. Christ is enough. Christ is Savior. He's the example. He's life itself. Then a true disciple does not fear man or his reaction. He fears only God, but the perfect love of Christ has cast out his fear of eternal judgment because he knows he is perfectly loved by God, more valuable than many sparrows. That's his identity. He sees himself as loved by God. God's not his adversary. God's not trying to you know, kick him into doing the right things. He loves God and he wants to serve God and he knows he is loved by God. Then a true disciple confesses Christ before men. He is unashamed of his testimony for Christ, therefore he is confessed by Christ before the Father. He is claimed by Christ before the throne of God to be one of his own. Then a true disciple loves no, no one or nothing more than he loves God. That doesn't mean he doesn't love other things. I love my truck. I love my dog. You know, I love my family. I love my wife. You know, I love all those things, but not in comparison to my love for God. God comes first. I've often shared that. He loves God. He loves Christ with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And lastly, he receives an eternal reward. Because all his works done in Christ are for Christ and will be rewarded in heaven. Even a cup of cold water. Because you're loved more than many sparrows. I, love, I, I just love those sayings. I just can't get over it. Anyway, for such are the rigors and reward of our loving and gracious God. An impossible life, yet by God's grace made possible. Let me just close with this thought. You know the parable of the talents, and you probably heard multiple versions and explanations and everything. The five-talent guy went out and made five more talents. Obviously, he was the preacher, missionary, whatever. Two guy, two, the two-talent guy, which is a talent is an immense amount of money. If you had one talent today, by those standards, you would be filthy rich. The two-talent guy went out and did the same. He made four talents, and you know his reward was, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. Be master over much. Then the one-talent guy. He takes his talent, an enormous amount of money for the master to give him, and he buries it. And the master comes back, and, and he unburies it and gives it back to him. He says, see, you have, I know you to be a hard man, reaping where you don't sow, and where you scatter no seed, and so on and so forth. And the master says, really? You knew me to be a hard man? Well then, you should have just taken my money and put it in the bank. (laughs) I don't know if that strikes you as being gracious. That That is incredibly gracious. You should have just put the talent in the bank and I would have had the interest that it would accrue, and I would have been happy with that. And so he says, you wicked, lazy slave. And he says, cast him into the outer darkness. That man would have went to heaven. Otherwise, if he had just put the money in the bank. If he would have just been willing to give a cup of cold water. If he would have just been willing to use his house for hospitality. If he would have just been willing to love the brethren and be part of the body of Christ. You know, the, our God is so gracious. It, 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 it's overwhelming to me. Because I look at the rigors of this and, 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 you know, I look at my life and it's like, oh man, am I really living up to this stuff? 
You know, am I constantly confessing Christ before men? Am I, is He number one all the time, every minute of every day? Do I love Him with all everything I have? And I don't know if I can answer in the affirmative completely. You know, there are times. But you know what? When given the opportunity, I can put, you know, the talent in the bank. I can give somebody a cup of cold water. I can love those who love me in the body of Christ. That's what we're all about, right? I just want you to be thinking on these things. Uh, you know, st- this past these past couple chapters have been so convicting. And yet, I want you to see the grace of God in there too. God's not demanding. He's demanding everything. And at the same time, not really asking for that much. And, and it's mind-boggling to me. And I want to give him everything, but he takes what I'm willing to give. Does that make sense? I hope. So, I just encourage you with those words. Look for somebody to give a cup of cold water to. If you're having a problem being part of the body of Christ. And, you know, people ask, why is church important? Because they will see our love and they will know that we are His disciples. That's why church is so important. One of the reasons. There there are many. But that's the ultimate one, I think. Because they see us loving one another and ministering to one another and serving one another. The world looks on and goes, man, that is so different. You know, I, I was reading about the when Katrina hit the Louisiana, I guess it was Louisiana, and, and they're in the Superdome, and all these charlatans are going down there selling a bottle of water, you know, 12 ounce thing for five bucks. You know, and then you have Christian organizations like Samaritan's Purse going down there and giving it away. The world takes notice of that kind of stuff. You know, and that's, that's what they should be seeing in us. That's what they should be seeing in our church. That's what they should be in seen in all churches that love and honor the Lord Jesus Christ. So, anyway, pray about that. See how God would speak to you through this sermon and the last few sermons. And let's be true disciples of Christ. Let's pray.